You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. Welcome back to the Living Desert Zoo, America's most underrated gem of the zoo world. Now so far we've toured their award-winning Australian adventures, some of their 20-acre African safari. So today, we will be continuing exactly where we left off. To get you caught up, here's a link to part one. Now before we begin, if this is your first time here, I recommend please hitting all of those positive buttons so you can officially be a part of this Zoo Crew family. I last left you all to hang out with the African Safari Hogs, and so that takes us to Village Watutu. The welcome sign reads, Water is precious in the desert and acts like a magnet to both man and wildlife. Springs that developed around them often become gathering areas for local tribes. Assured of water and shade, the tribes would come to visit and barter with each other for livestock and other goods. Local tribesmen created simple bomas to hold the livestock they brought to trade. The very first boma is actually the entrance to a petting corral, or a petting zoo, built specifically to keep some of the world's most dangerous creatures from escaping. I'm referring to children, but luckily for the guests, the corral was void of any and their lives were spared. Actually, as part of the theme, the fencing was built to keep out today's first species, an animal known to stalk the Watutu tribesmen and a cat that we don't have the pleasure of seeing enough. The large, the elusive leopard. Like many cats, they prefer to be solitary by nature. And of all the big carnivores in Africa, they are probably the least likely to attack us, since they are solitary and they rely on themselves and themselves only to survive. They know that getting injured could lead to starvation. If a leopard does go near us, it usually means they're just interested in the livestock, but farmers will retaliate with lethal methods. African leopards are vulnerable, so not endangered, at least not yet. But right now, we are looking at one of the most endangered mammals in the world. This is an Amur leopard that ranges the border of China and Russia, adapted for mountainous forests and not necessarily the savannah. But as we've learned, African leopards in America are in short supply. So the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has elected to focus on displaying and breeding the more endangered species and use the Amur leopard to represent their cousins in Africa. Speaking of being in short supply in America and often associated with cats, 139 episodes later, and I'm finally able to introduce you to the striped hyena. Wait, what do you mean associated with cats? Well, that's a slight exaggeration. You'll probably hear someone call them a wolf, a big fox, or a painted dog like I have. If you do ever hear that and you want to sound like a know-it-all, let them know that hyenas belong to their own unique family and molecular data places them in a super order of filiforms, an order that consists of mongooses, civets, and even cats. The Living Desert's signs summarizes all four species of hyenas, how they live and cooperate in groups, and dispel the myths that they only scavenge for food. All hyenas giggle, and they even drew up a a pretty descriptive diagram of their genitalia. And maybe if I'm ever brave enough, we'll talk about that someday. If there's any animal here that deserves to represent the living desert, it's the dromedary camel, an extremely common species. In fact, they're not even considered wild at all. But who wouldn't want to see a face like this every day? Dromedaries have a friendly temperament. As you probably know, they've been used as transportation for thousands of years. They have long, strong legs, broad feet, and a hump on their back that stores fat, which they use as a source of energy when there's no food. Connected to the same barrier is another hardy hoofstock 
that's trying their best to avoid extinction. But before we get to them, right in front of this huge pit of gravel is a huge reptile. The African Spurred Tortoise. Like a lot of things around here, they have adaptations to surviving these harsh conditions. They obviously need hot temperatures to survive, but if they can't handle too much heat, they'll either create a burrow or smear saliva on their legs to cool down. Now, as I was saying, the Adax is one of the most endangered species you'll ever see. Some estimate there's fewer than 100 left in the wild, but there actually could be as many as 1,000 in offside projects that work to breed and reintroduce this antelope into the wild to help restore the ecological balance of the Sahara. So, you know how girls go to the salon to get their hair dyed and you have to pretend that there's a difference? Well, the Adex can actually change their fur and it really does make a difference. Their hair goes from white in the summer to grayish brown in the winter and the white hairs reflect the heat from the sun to stay cool, while the hair in the winter not only grows thicker, but the darker color can also absorb and insulate more heat. Even though it probably won't be the last thing you see in the village in reality, it will be for us. On the left hand side is a small aviary with a gorgeous racket-tailed roller, spur-winged lapwing, white-headed buffalo weavers, and the Tavita Golden Weaver. We're now waving our goodbyes to the residents of the village Watutu and stepping on back into the main safari. Hopefully our next animals can forgive me for ignoring them earlier by the warthogs. If you watched part one, you'll know what I'm talking about here. I'm referring to the Cape Porcupines. Not to be confused with the African Crested Porcupines. What's the difference? Not much really, honestly. I really couldn't find a lot in my research. They're pretty much identical. But capes are a little larger, and apparently of the two, they have a line of white spikes going down their skin towards their butt. I mean, I guess. I did read the other day that many zoos label their capes as African Crested Porcupines, so don't let them fool you, just stare at their butt long enough and you'll be able to tell who is who. Our next species is an unmistakable carnivore. This right here is another great instance where the zoo used the environment to their advantage. It really does look like a slice of the dry African savanna. This is a haven for cheetahs. They have a need for speed. But like any cat, they enjoy a lazy day from time to time. Or most of the time. In fact, many will tell you that they spend 90% of their day doing absolutely nothing. Lucky. But it really is one of the most efficient ways to avoid the heat. When they go out to hunt, they really try to stick to breakfast time or dinner time when it's a little colder. For decades, there was this myth that claimed that cheetahs can't sprint or hunt for too long because their body temperature rises so quickly that they overheat and give up. First of all, their temperature naturally rises from 1 or 2 degrees Celsius throughout the day by just sitting there. But it does rise half a degree more when they sprint and fail to catch anything. Now if you ask me, half a degree doesn't really warrant as overheating. When they bag a kill, their temperature rises by nearly a degree and a half. It's believed it's not from the chase or because they're energetic eaters, but possibly due to the stress that another predator might come along and seize their prey. Coming up is an exhibit that continues the safari strand of seven large fields that overlooks the wild desert. Which, like the giraffes, there's also a golf course right behind all of this. These seven habitats feature some kind of hoofstock, like the Grevy's zebra. You might be used to seeing them in a large, lush savanna, but it's a nice change of pace to see them depicted in their other preferred environment, which is the semi-arid desert. If you were to just turn your head over a little to the left, they live adjacent to a marabou stork, who used to live in the rhino savanna, but was off exhibit this time around for the ongoing bird flu. 
Big animals are cool and all, but my favorite kind of African exhibit is when they focus on the smaller stuff. The kind of animals that would be so much harder to spot in the wild. Or better, ones that are rewarding to find in zoos. Like these shy rock hyraxes, or the leopard tortoise. Clearly named for their cat-like reflexes and definitely not for their leopard-like spots on their shell. If you can't spot them, you'll certainly be pleased to be able to be near the bat-eared fox, the animal that you least want to gossip around. Those five inch long satellite dishes on top of their head help them detect the faintest of sounds, picking up the slightest rustle of prey in the grass, and even hear what's going on underground. I'm telling you, if every guy in the world had a set of ears like that, I guarantee that we would still have trouble listening. If looking at all of this dirt is making you really thirsty, I don't blame you. But it's what these animals like. Apparently this 16,000 square foot sandy oasis is a heaven for yellow-billed storks, which I'm pretty sure they prefer lagoons, but regardless, they were also off exhibit for the bird flu anyways. There's another African spurred tortoise, moving at such a record speed that even the squirrels had to see it to believe it. Now no matter how much sun they try to get, the slender horned gazelle will always be known as the palest gazelle. Although you gotta give them credit, they still have a pretty decent tan going. These gazelles laugh at the idea of thirst. Like the warthog, if water isn't around, they can just hydrate from the moisture and the plants that they eat. Slender horns live in small pockets in North Africa. They were excessively hunted for sport, their meat, and because people really just have to hang their horns up on their walls. This gazelle is endangered, and as little as a few hundred could be out there in the wild. Now, it's not like it's a competition, but if you were to look up what the rarest gazelle in the world is, Google would tell you that it's the Adra gazelle. The largest, tallest, and considered the most endangered of their kind. Even though their population is comparable to their friends, Adras are classified as critically endangered. The Living Desert Zoo works with the AZA's Species Survival Plan and have successfully brought a couple of calves into the world in the past couple of years. And organizations like the Sahara Conservation Fund work with North African locals to help maintain the natural circle of life in the Sahara Desert. And that includes monitoring and protecting the population of this rare gem. Continuing to our left, you'll find another beautiful pile of sand, dirt, and gravel, and the Speaks Gazelle. Now imagine having a bunch of excess skin, but that skin is in your nose. The Speaks Gazelle can inflate that skin and amplify a loud honk. You won't hear anything, but you will see it happening if you click on that card in the corner. If you were to look up what the heaviest flying bird in the world is, so many sources would tell you that it's the Cory Bustard. A male's wingspan can be up to 9 feet and max out at 42 pounds. That's pretty much the same size as the Speaks Gazelle. But it's not like an ostrich where they weigh so much that they can't even fly. It's just this Bustard doesn't like to, unless they are really in danger. But if not, they're okay with just running. So far we've seen a couple of cats, something that looks like a dog, and now a species that's part of the true dog family. African painted dogs. Together they are loyal, loving, and spend their lives devoted to friendship and tearing other animals to shreds. You think pack hunters, you might think of wolves and lions, but neither can live up to the success of the hunting dog. And with success comes strategy and heart. Every pack has a different plan of action for every individual prey. To go after the large stuff like wildebeest, they'll flush out the weak and nip at their legs until they give in. For animals like antelope, the pack will circle them and cut off any possible angle to escape. These techniques really aren't entirely unique to the painted dog, but the wild dog is far more determined to eat and keep up with their targets compared to some big cats who might give up after a couple of springs and pounces. If I could add a cuteness overload warning right now, I would. When Mark filmed in 2021, 
he got great close-ups of the Fennec Fox. As cute as they are, that's not who I'm really talking about. As of 2023, the fox was replaced with a small cat. They give some resemblance to an orange tabby. And I really can never blame a guest for wondering why a zoo would ever display a house cat with a bunch of other wild animals around them. Sand cats are as wild as they come and are more suited for life in the dunes than any other cat in the world. That thick, sandy fur not only insulates extreme heat in the day, but when that sun goes down, they're still protected when the temps might drop to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what about instances where they have to walk on the hot sand and scorching rocks? Luckily for the sand cat, they will never have to experience any refried toe beans. As you can see, while padding on most cat's feet is exposed, a sand cat's is covered in fur. As you can see in this episode's part one, this all starts with exhibits that were just asking to display meerkats, but they don't because like I said, the living desert really likes to mix things up. Well, about that. These have slender tailed meerkats, members of the mongoose family. They are gold medalists at shoveling dirt, digging up their own body weight in just a matter of a few seconds, which is an impressive one to two pounds. Excavating really is one of the most important skills for them to survive. Like the naked mole rat, they tunnel out several underground systems with sleeping, nursing, and toilet chambers. They retire to these trenches to slumber at night, but they scurry around looking for food during the day. And while they eat, one or a couple of meerkats will prop itself on its hind legs for maximum view of the horizon to keep watch for any hawks, jackals, snakes, and more. And if they spot something, the watcher will bark and let the mob know to jump into the nearest burrow as soon as possible. While the painted dogs have gazelles and busters on their right to keep them company, another rare animal roams to their left. The channel's very first Arabian oryx is a visually striking antelope. Every oryx species are exposed to the sweltering sun. We as humans involuntarily cool down by sweating. They don't have the luxury of wasting any water. Instead, their kidneys are specialized to reabsorb as much water as they can from their urine. Digging holes, finding shade, and hydrating from plants allows this oryx to survive without water for nearly a whole year. If you know anyone who's a little iffy about the idea of zoos, tell them to look up the Arabian oryx's story. There was a tradition to hunt them for their fur, meat, and apparently because people thought those horns possessed some kind of magical powers. The last Arabian oryx was shot in 1972 and declared extinct. Extinct in the wild. Thanks to help from captive breeding programs in zoos and other wildlife programs, this oryx is not only no longer extinct in the wild, but they are no longer even considered endangered. This herd's acre-large abode sits at the bottom of one of the zoo's single largest exhibits, one of the first things we'll see in the next Living Desert episode. In the meantime, we have just one final stop, and would you look at that, after all this time, this is where they've been keeping the lush grass. When you do come here, because clearly I've convinced you to, look for an Abyssinian ground hornbill and their roommates. One source tells me that these are Cuvier's gazelles, one of the rarest zoo animals in the country. But a few other sources tell me that these are Speaks gazelles. Whatever they are, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say how amazing it is that there are so many hoofed animals in this area. They're not exactly known to attract a crowd, but too many zoos around this country are phasing them out for more popular species. And that's just one of the ways the Living Desert Zoo likes to stay unique. And that, tomcats, mollies, and kittens will do it for part two, sub part three of California's Living Desert Zoo which means there is just one more section to go. But this African adventure won't stop here. In a couple of years, Mark and I will be bringing you back for a look at the African Safaris Phase 3. So please stay tuned and stay wild. See if you can answer this episode's trivia question. And thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.